All right, we paid the first person who stood up, just, just so you know. We'll, we'll, get, we'll buy you that beer later. Nothing is what it seems with the yes men. Um, uh, talk to me about the action switchboard. Uh, uh, what's happening with that? Um, we've just launched it. It's um, rolling out. And uh, you can sign up, just go to actionswitchboard.net. We've just launched um, a collaboration with organizers from the People's Climate March to use the action switchboard to try to keep the momentum of the People's Climate March going. Because it's kind of, you know, there's all these people who are energized, they want to do something, and we're going to uh, work to, to get them to uh, contribute their ideas, their energy, which they have, they want to do stuff. And it's kind of a, it's a platform that enables us and people we work with uh, to assist direct actions in, in happening, this sort or any kind, uh, including arrestable ones. Um, we're gonna, we, yeah, who knows? Is there a special drop-down menu for arrest? Yeah, yeah there is, actually. <laughs> and and I, it, I forgot to Civil thank... Civil and criminal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I forgot to thank one person who was instrumental in making the, uh, the McDonald's NYPD collaboration happened is Jerry Goralnik, and he's going to be one of the people working. We're going to have a whole team of people who have uh, worked on actions with us over the years who will help others. So it's kind of, uh, you know, an Avon pyramid scheme. <laughs> uh, we've got a few minutes to take some questions. If you want to raise your hand, I will call on you. Don't be shy. They have cards. <laughs> come on, come on. Who's got a question? Yeah. Well, I mean, just to point out the obvious, I mean, using impersonation, satire, doing the opposite, uh, the Hayoka tradition, this is a um, hermetic tradition. There's numerous traditions throughout cultures around the world that use satire to infiltrate the fog of consciousness. You guys seem to have discovered that. The, the, the question was that, that, that there's a kind of uh, long-held tradition of, of using satire to penetrate consciousness, and, and you seem to be creating a modern version of that. Do, do you think about a tradition that you come from? Uh, well, I think that um, this kind of thing is something that we started doing when we were quite young. This, you know, mischief, you start rebelling against <clears throat> sort of uniformity of, of culture. You know, we kind of grew up at the same time as... Um, big box stores started landing, you know, out in the countryside, like UFOs, and and there's a way that you start to, I, I think, impulsively do that, or compulsively in our case. Um, but then, as we go along, and as we do more of this, we discover these traditions, and and so yeah, there's you know all kinds of traditions of of rebellion that that involve mischief. Yeah, going back as far as you want, like obviously Native Americans have huge tradition of trickster. Um, for, for us, I think we were inspired without knowing it by a lot of people who have done it pretty recently in this country, the Yippies, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in the 60s, before that. There's tons of people, some of them we know, some of them not, because it's sort of ephemeral, but we were inspired, I think, to do this by them, even if we couldn't name them. Um, it just becomes part of the culture, and that's really important. That's one of the points of the film, is that doing what you can makes a difference. Uh, Laura, these two guys are in the forefront. Uh, you're more behind the scenes. Can you talk about how you got drawn into the Yes Men's world and how you work together? Um, I've known them a long time, uh, but before they were Yes Men. Um, so I think that I kind of watched that moment, and I was around when they first met and started hanging out in San Diego. Um, around that time of the obsessive hanging out and the trip across the country. I was like getting phone calls from that road trip. I remember that. So it was um, <coughs> a long time and I wanted to be able to kind of tell that part of the story that this is, it looks really fun and the other films show these guys kind of like flying around with superhero capes almost, but the reality is that it's actually very hard to do this kind of work and very hard to do it for a long time. And the older you get, the harder it is to keep going. How do you keep going? And they do keep going, and I feel like that message of how they keep going and how you lose your hope and get it back again is one that we all need to find when we're faced with really big challenges like this, really huge problems that seem insurmountable. You have to wake up in the morning and figure out a way that you're going to be able to fight back, and hopefully there's a kernel of that that everyone can walk away from from seeing the film. And so working with them is... Um, 
never boring, <laughs> as you can imagine, <laughs> and full of lots of surprises and um, keeps everyone on their toes at all moments. All right, Pat, yeah, this woman here. Uh, which action did you keep people, did people not pick up on for the longest that you got to, uh, like no one figured out what you were doing, the news organizations and stuff? Which, which action did you take the furthest before you got found out? Well, the last one, when we left, they were still calling us three hours later and asking us where Colin Powell was. <laughs> just kept, it kept going. And I was like, after the dance, I figured this is obviously cats out of the bag, but they kept still calling and saying, hey, you know, like you guys are coming back with Powell, right? I didn't really believe that one. I thought that was a joke at the end of the film. I didn't that really, I mean, that really happened. <laughs> oh, it absolutely happened. <laughs> it did happen. Wait, I'm really curious. Did anybody else think that was a joke? Okay. Uh, yes? Okay. A few. Yeah, because the people were so, like, they're coming up and shaking your hands and stuff. That was real. Yeah. They're really not monsters, turns out. <laughs> uh, question over here. Well, we don't actually have to bring them into the conference room. The conference is doing that. Sometimes they do it quite poorly, and there's a very sparsely attended conference room, and then we're disappointed. But um, but once people are there, you know, they're there to see uh, whoever's speaking, and usually we're introduced as the most important people in the room, and so then they automatically respect us, and automatically our acting can be bad, and people still believe it, and so uh, it just goes smoothly, um, uh, at least in our experience. Yeah, and, and Colin Powell draws a crowd if you announce that he's coming. Um, the, the one time we did have to drum up our own crowd was for the Chamber of Commerce uh, action because we actually hosted a press conference, uh, or rather we didn't, but the activists we were working with on that did. And um, so we actually had to send out a press advisory to get people there. And it's a long story, but we simultaneously launched a blockade of the Chamber of Commerce's phone lines so that they, they couldn't get in. We just announced, call them, call them, harass them. <laughs> to a few thousand activists, and, and that worked, except in one case, and that's how the guy ended up finding out and showing up, which is good that he did. Uh, question in the middle of this woman. Which part of it? The, the, the Which part of the current political? Well, the, the fact that we're heading into a period where the, the House and the Senate are going to be controlled by the people who want to be so high Oh, no. It's, it's always the same. I mean, you always have challenges. One thing that's pretty constant, though, is that people always think that the current moment is harder to achieve change than, <laughs> than the times when people did achieve change, which are many, many, many. But people always think, oh, this time it couldn't happen like that. That's just, I mean, it's, it's not your fault. It's just our reflex, what we always think is that this is unique. But it's not, like, massive changes happened in America many times, or at least three, and it can happen again. <laughs> uh, all right, right here. Just a slight technical question. Can you get permission to use the footage from, say, the guy reacting at the chamber, you know? Um, the question is, how did you, how'd you get permission to use the footage from people who, you know, clearly are not on your side. Well, he's a public figure. He's the executive director of communications for a major organization, the Chamber of Commerce, and he walked into a press conference, which is a, a public space, and so therefore he gets to be on camera. He gets to be the and star. In the final action there, uh, I mean, we not only posted things on the doors, but um, Mary, who works with us, actually stood up in the front of the room and announced to everybody very clearly that if they stayed in the room, they would, could very well be on television or in a movie. And they all stayed because they wanted to see, well, I don't know, they wanted to oh, see what happened. <laughs> oh, yeah. Frank is here. Yeah, yeah, Frank is here. Frank gives us really good explanations for that, too, because I'm always yes. calling him and saying, okay, so what do I really need to do in advance of this action? Oh, the other thing we do is we post releases that basically says, you know, we're shooting here today, and by walking into this room, you're giving your permission to be on camera. Did we do okay, Frank? Did we do okay? Whatever Frank says. Sometimes he says no. Question right here. 
Yeah, um, tricksters usually don't like to be on masks. And one of the things I liked about the film is how you really brought who these people were, how human they were. You know, they're, they sort of are these epic sort of role models of fun and politics. But I wanted to know in the structuring of the film how you chose to do that and how hard it was to get both of them to reveal the sides that they did. I think there's a question for Laura. How in the film did you get them to go a little bit more personal? Um, it's It was hard <laughs> to get them to do that. I think that um, they're more comfortable with being behind the mask than not. And um, it was, it, you know, but eventually I think um, we all understood why that was an important thing to do, uh, especially for the third film, because we didn't want to just do the same film over and over again. This is the third one, and we wanted to show something different. And um, structuring it is difficult. There's essentially two parallel stories that are going through the whole time, which is one, one which is the climate change story, and the other one which is the story of the trajectory of their activism and really a story about activism itself and why one would do this and why one would keep doing this and showing the, the trials and tribulations of all those things and then eventually getting to a point at the end where they all come together and you say we have to act still because we really have no choice, we must act. They must act, they must compulsively do what they do, they can't stop themselves. I mean, all evidence shows maybe we shouldn't do this anymore. Things happen, <laughs> and then you still keep going. And how, you know. Uh, ultimately, I think the real hero of the film is Occupy, the movement, and everything that came out of that, and so on. And I think to really show that, we had to show what it meant for us as people with our troubles. So there was no choice. We had to make a personal film, and it was a pill we had to swallow. And that's big pill. Big pill, as Laura knows. Uh, let me see if there's uh, anyone else. Well, right here. Which country are the most uh, responsive to, to the yes men in terms of distribution? In terms of the film distribution? Uh, the question is, uh, what country is most responsive to yes men in terms of uh, your films getting out there? Belarus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been sold, right? So, yeah. I would just say that there's a following. Um, uh, in Europe, there's definitely a following in Europe, and there's kind of pockets of people, like in in France and in Germany and in Scandinavia and other places. Um, it's hard. It's hard to say, but I think that there is a, somewhat of a global audience. I don't want to be like we're Transformers or something, but you know, we try. <laughs> and specifically for this film, it was very important for us that the film have a global reach and that the film have a global message. There's a way that this film could have gone down. Um, a story that would have stuck with a kind of American energy story, which is absolutely a valid story, but we wanted to make the reach larger so that we could involve more people. And we are actually very pleased to uh, have just announced yesterday that we have a deal with The Orchard for distributing this film, and so they'll be releasing it uh, sometime probably in late spring, but we still have to talk to them about that. In North America. One more question, and Laura's pointing them out. So how does the Action Network, I mean, the Action Switchboard relate to the Yes Labs? Um, how does well, the Action Switchboard relate to the Yes Labs? The Yes Lab is a, a thing we launched after the last film, actually. Many of these, uh, well, and there, it's, it was a, like, work, it is workshops that we do with various groups, and some of these actions actually came out of that. Um, and the action switchboard is basically the same thing. It's just online and also in person. You didn't really explain it. Michael? <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, so it's, it's, uh, I mean, basically, we have a nonprofit organization called the Yes Lab, and it helps and facilitates uh, organizations who want to do similar attention getting stunts for their campaigns at moments when that kind of attention is needed to galvanize opinion, to potentially change laws. Um, we realized that we couldn't serve all of the organizations that were coming to us, and a lot of people have signed up and simply said, I have a skill, or I know how to do something, or I want to participate. And so we figured out that if we could match make them with each other, maybe we could get a whole lot more action happening. And so it's kind of like if you mashed up Facebook, Kickstarter, 
Tinder and protest.net. <laughs> That's what it is. So if you go sign up for it, we will send you an email and you'll be asked to uh, participate, to suggest projects of your own or to browse the projects and join projects. And we have facilitators who work there and also see what skills you have and where you live and we'll email you and put you in touch with people who are doing other projects who you might want to collaborate with and give you the choice to do that if you so desire. And Michael, they can <coughs> sign up now, right, at actionswitchboard.net, correct? Yes, exactly. Thank you. Okay, so you can go to actionswitchboard.net and sign up and be a part of that community. That's actionswitchboard.net. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're very proud to pr uh, present to the U.S. premiere of the Yes Men Are Revolting. If you want to experience more of what happened in Doc MIC these past eight days, uh, please go to docmic.net where we've got videos and photos and blogs uh, about uh, all the films. And, do you want to do the last word? No. Are you guys just... Yeah. I think we, we have a little party afterward if anybody wants to join us at a bar. <laughs> it's, Come it's, find us. Yeah, it's not huge, but we'll, we'll tell you on the way out. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. West Side? Yeah, it's West called Side Tavern. West Side Tavern. It's at the West Side Tavern. I so. hate us. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming to Dr. MIC. Thanks especially to Lord Nick for yesterday. <laughs>